I'm talking about two global online ecosystems of platforms. And of course, there's two in the world that dominate our current online lives. One is the Chinese, which you have mentioned briefly, but these are the five biggest companies. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't line out the uh, slides, but these are the five biggest companies in the Chinese ecosystem. You probably have heard most of them by name. Uh, Didi is the Chinese Uber, as Martin mentioned, and of course, uh, uh, Alibaba is the Chinese Amazon, more or less. But they operate in a closed and closed sort of gated system. Um, I will concentrate though on the American system and here's the big five that we've already encountered today. Um, and that system, that ecosystem of platforms dominates the rest of the world more or less because you know the Chinese is sort of en encapsulated but this is the system that has us, you know, all of us in Europe, in Asia, in South America and America of course in its uh, grip. Um, so. Uh, there have been various attempts by the American ecosystem to enter the Chinese system, but most of these attempts have been in vain. Although, you know, Uber now has 20% of Didi, for instance, but Uber also owns 20%, for instance, of Spotify. Now, squeezed in between those two ecosystems, Chinese and Europe, of course, uh, Chinese and American, of course, there's Europe. And Europe has, you know, uh, very few digital platforms and no unicorns at all. Actually, we had just one unicorn born last week. You know which one that is? Adyen, you're right. So it's the pay system. That was our first unicorn born last week because it passed the 1 billion uh, euro sign. But that's the first one. And I think booking.com is then the first you know, largest platform in Holland. But so Spotify is basically the only European platform that is within the top 50 of biggest platforms in the world online. So basically, Europe has become very dependent on the American ecosystem. And why is that important and how does that work? Those are my few basic questions. And my uh, last question will be, what can Europe do? So this is just an intermezzo that I found this last week. Of course, we hear from CEOs all the time, including this one, who is probably very you know, famous. Uh, in, uh, he's famous in America and he is in Europe. But we're hearing from CEOs that uh, Europe is cracking down on Silicon Valley out of jealousy. You know, we're just a jealous bunch of guys who can't stand the fact that we don't have any unicorns and we should actually deal with that. Um, I happen to take a different view. And, you know, for me, the American platform ecosystem hardly allows to carve out public space, which is mostly what Europeans like to do. And that's something that Europeans are missing in that uh, American ecosystem of platforms. So basically, I think, you know, um, European society would mostly favor or at least they would welcome a kind of model, a platform ecosystem model that would at least appreciate the kind of, you know, public system that we know, which has public space, which has more or less public sectors, although I agree with Martin that financialization over the past 25 years has certainly taken its toll in Europe. But anyway, um, I think that, you know, Europe, Europe certainly needs, and that in that respect, Peter Thiel, you know, I don't think it's out of jealousy, but it should be, it actually could be one of Europe's strengths to define more or less public values in that system. So I think rather than sort of um, crack down on that European system, we should try to find modes of saying, hey, we could work with that system, but we should build in public values. So this is my basic line. This is the question that I asked that I can't answer for you today. I wrote a complete book on it, worked for four years, five years to work on this very, you know, single question. I didn't find the answer, so you won't get it from me today. But it's an important question. How can European societies guard public values and the common good in an online world that is dominated by this American ecosystem platform or uh, ecosystem, or if you wish, by certainly in its neighboring Chinese system, but neither one of those systems actually fit that Rhineland model of European states where, you know, that model incorporates at least a market system, a, a state system and a civil society sector. I will come back to that balance between the three a little later in my presentation. First, let me focus on how does that American ecosystem work? Because I think we haven't done enough work on defining what platforms really do in that ecosystem, which position they have and how we should judge them more or less. 
So what we did with my team over the past few years, and I'm going to show you the book and the credits. I have two co-authors in the book later on. Um, let me explain how this works. Of course, here's the big five, the big five unicorns. And I totally agree with Martin that Amazon is the biggest player in all this. We in Europe always think that it's Facebook and secondly, Google. No, it's absolutely Amazon, if only for the fact that cloud servers, you know, almost 80% of cloud serving services are in the hands of Amazon. But I'll get back to that soon. Now, what um, you know, what concerns me most is not that these are the, by the five biggest companies in the world with an incredible market value. The, you know, in terms of GDP, they are the fifth state in the world. But that's, you know, apart. My concern is how do these companies, how do they have power in our social lives, our everyday lives, our traffic, our economic traffic, social traffic. That is really my concern when I talk about public values. Disclaimer, I'm neither a lawyer nor an econo economist. So I totally speak as a, you know, someone who studied this from the humani humanities point of view. So that's why my concern is more or less with these public values. Um, how does this work? Uh, slide two, what we have tried to do, I'm sorry for these have become eggs, but they used to be circles and, and they are circles in my slide. Um, what we have tried to do is we've tried to identify the basic, inf what we call infrastructural platforms in this ecosystem, in the American ecosystem. And we came up with about 100, not just 100, but you know, they're changing every day, but about 100 infrastructural platforms. They are, as you can see, you know, in the various circles, they are social networks, video platforms, web hosting, base systems, I identification and login systems, cloud services, very important Amazon service, advertising agencies, search engines, maps, app stores, AI and analytics services. And that's just a handful. Uh, you see DeepMind, you see uh, all of them have different strengths. So usually they're duopolis in, let's say in search, they're duopolis, but then in uh, analytics, there are you know, three of them. So there are various strengths and they go with uh, variously monopolies or duopolis. Um, these are what we call infrastructural services, but societies across the globe have become dependent on these infrastructures. They're no longer the railroads and just, you know, the offline services. They have become online infrastructures. And that's very important. These infrastructures are border agnostic, they're app agnostic, and they're basically sector agnostic. Now, in each of our sectors, we're getting, and now I'm trying to systemize more or less the, the system that you just uh, pointed out, but in each of our sectors in societies, and there's many of those sectors, these big five companies have also developed platforms that are not, cannot be called infrastructural, but for the sector as such, they have become very dominant and important. So look at this, um, by the way, in our research that is going to be published in the new book, which is coming out in August. We have researched four sectors. We couldn't do more. It's just, you know, it was, you know, it was way too much to do four, but of course there are many, many, many different sectors. We've chosen deliberately two private sectors, two more or less public sectors, although you can argue whether they're entirely public or private. Urban transport is one of the more or less private sectors we chose, so is news. And we focused on two, health and education in terms of uh, public sectors. Now, what we are seeing, and on this map, we have sort of, you know, you can see the, uh, uh, the symbols. It's probably, you can't read it properly from all the way over there. But um, what we are seeing now is that the big five not only dominate the infrastructural platforms that you will still see in the middle, but that was the slide you saw before this one. But also in the different sectors, you've seen that they've come to dominate the actual sector performance. So let's take, for instance, uh, well, Google is the easiest, of course. Um, I was particularly struck by the educational sector, which, uh, you know, the public sector that I started to uh, do research on. And I found that Google, for instance, in terms of Google Apps for Education, which is <coughs> becoming a very powerful player in education. Um, at the same time, of course, uh, it's creating more or less a path dependency between the infrastructural and the sectoral uh, maps. Now, what you, what you see here is just uh, those relationships in terms of ownership. That's only a tiny fraction of what 
is what we are actually talking about. Can I get some water here? I'm sorry, I had a throat infection last week, so I'm still sort of recovering. Um, so what you're seeing here is just ownership relations. Um, you know, the big five who are, try who are uh, becoming very big sectoral players over the, re uh, over the past few years. What you do not see, though, that is that platformization, not only, you know, it's not just these four sectors, of course, it's finance, it's retail. You know, you've shown at least 10 more sectors that we could cover. But underlying this system, rather than ownership and governance, is a system of what I call um, platform mechanisms. We wrote an entire chapter in the book, uh, and platform mechanisms are basically the invisible mechanisms by which there, you know, you can actually draw lines between the different uh, uh, infrastructures and sectors. Let me give you a few examples. Um, for instance, data flows and algorithmic flows are now going not just from, infra to, from infrastructure to sector. There we come to the Google Shopping case, which was, of course, an infrastructural platform, Google Search and how that was connected to a sector, retail, Google Shopping, it's only a tiny little thing. You know, it's only that particular relation. What we're seeing is Google has these relationships not just between infrastructural platforms, but between infrastructural and sectoral platforms in pretty much every single sector in society. And not only that, but also how can it use, for instance, its data flows and algorithmic lock-ins between sectors which is something that is not covered for, not covered by antitrust law, it's not covered by competition law, it's not covered by a lot of things. So what we try to do, and I can't go into detail because I don't have enough time today, but all of these arrows, you know, they symbolize, they stand for a invisible, an invisible platform mechanism that is connecting sectors to sectors, infrastructures to sectors, and everything that's in between. So, there are many, many invisible threats that uh, connect this ecosystem, and that's why it is so important to focus on an ecosystem rather than individual lines between infrastructures and sectors. And that is exactly what our law currently is based on. So there's a structural ecosystem, infrastructural sort of flaw that we need to address. Um, so basically, based on this you know, uh, research, we concluded that these mechanisms are largely intransparent, and these mechanisms uh, sort of cause public, uh, uh, public, the public sector and the common good, which we have highlighted here because we thought it was under-researched. And we've highlighted that they're becoming, because of this system, becoming more and more privatized, pretty much by the day. So that's you know, what we've seen over the past year. So we are really concerned with the public sector, the, pub, you know, the common good, and what, you know, what I call public values. Now, I will get back to that in a second. Now, my main question, what can Europe do? Of course, you know, we can complain about all this. Oh, the system is so bad. And, you know, I don't like that sort of, I've been complaining for years now. And what I was, have been seeing last year's, last year, over the past year, we've seen a big, a huge backlash, especially in Europe. There were all these cases last year that, you know, sort of made me think, okay, now let's try to be constructive. What can Europe do about, rather than just complain about how bad the ecosystem is, which, you know, you could also do good things with that ecosystem. Um, so my question, how can European public value, uh, how can Europe guard public values and the common good? I decided first, the first thing you need to do is articulate value-centric platform policies. This is, of course, easier said than done. I promised you I won't have, you know, the ultimate answer. But at least we need to try to articulate what kind of values we want to articulate. These are the kind of values that we came up with. And of course, we've been talking about privacy, which is a very important value in Europe, a lot more important than it is overseas, but also security, accuracy, talk about the news, you know, and accuracy, how important that is. Um, but also, you know, this is not enough. We have a lot more values that we need to contain or we need to um, uh, cover, which is fairness, which is collectivity, which is a very important value in you know, social democratic European societies. 
responsibility, <coughs> accountability. How can we account for, you know, you talked about regulation and how many uh, more um, uh, staff we need, you know, to just to cover um, antitrust law. It's, or sorry, uh, privacy law, democratic control. Think about the whole Facebook case and how are we going to fix that? So there's all these values that we need to take a stance on, right? Now, I have a lot more to say about this, but I need to sort of uh, quickly glance at this. Pre well, in traditionally, I should say, all of these public values that you know, we find so important in our political and, and uh, uh, landscape, they used to be contained and they used to be uh, sort of framed within institutions. And what a lot of platforms do is they basically bypass institutions, right? So what Uber does is it sort of bypasses the regulations and all the institutional frameworks that we have put in place. Take privacy and schools. Well, schools as institutions have uh, more or less anchored the public values like privacy, like uh, fairness, for instance, or anti-discrimination. Platforms do not, do not have, they can bypass all these institutions and they have no accountability. Um, uh, you know, they, they don't have to be accounted for, they don't have to be held accountable. So, you know, you can bypass or ignore sectors, but still you get a backlash after a while, right? So that's what probably has been happening last year. Um, now, in the online world, we haven't anchored those values yet. So what we're trying to do, what you're seeing in Europe, that um, we're seeing the beginning of, you know, initiatives. This, for instance, is uh, the European, it refers to the 2016 EU Digitizing European Industry Initiative, which I think was a good beginning. It's right of sort of to define the principles according to which we can do business online. But I think the EU should clearly not stop at, uh, you know, defining the principles in terms of public values for markets, but it should also care more about their public sectors, which are now increasingly being either bypassed or undermined by platforms. So, you know, in that respect, I think the EU has a lot more to do than just uh, regulate markets. Um, let's get to my, quickly to some of my points. We need a far more comprehensive approach to regulation. What we're doing now, and this is, you know, very typically European, Martin has already mentioned it, we have the Google, uh, she's by the way, you know, one of my personal heroes because she actually went as far as doing this, which was, which was quite a thing with 500, 5,000, I think, lobbyists in Brussels. Still, we had that antitrust ruling, but of course, it's, as I said, it's a tiny, tiny little bit of that, you know, whole ecosystem spectrum. We've had, we've seen national and supranational measures taken against fake news. We've had just come out uh, an EU report in March on how we should battle fake news. And, you know, this is sort of a new problem for Europe that we have seen, you know, over the past months, we have seen uh, come into public view. And of course, we have the new GDPR, which is now, you know, Europe is now bracing for uh, 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 the GDPR and it's taking effect next month. The problem is all these current legal frameworks, you know, they're single frameworks and they're based on, let's say, separate treatments of societal values. So we have antitrust law you know, trying to level the playing field. We have privacy law trying to deal with privacy. We have competition law trying to, you know, cover the or the guarantee a level playing field. And we have taxation law, we have trade law, we have, you know, different types of frameworks that all deal with a different part of the law. But it's not a comprehensive view towards this particular ecosystem, systematic failure, I think. So the sum of each of those legal frameworks is still not enough to deal with the principles of, you know, how do we actually deal with a fair and uh, 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 online society? Um, so I think we really need this holistic approach. Third, we need to help update regulatory frameworks because they are certainly outdated right now and we need to, you know, we can't move as fast as, you know, to, as reality is. Um, forcing us to keep up with, but hey, I'm not a legal scholar, but even with my sort of lay point of view, I can see that uh, the law is not keeping up, you know, legal scholars and, and, and uh, legislation cannot keep up with what's happening in reality. So um, 
for one thing, as I just showed, the whole legal system is actually built on infrastructures and on sectors. But as I showed you in the second picture, what is happening now is that all those boundaries have become fluid. There is no such thing as a infrastructural platform that can be distinguished from a sectoral platform. The actual power of platforms is in the fluidity between different sectors, between infrastructures and sectors, and that whole sort of ecosystems that are uh, driven by the mechanisms that are not entirely visible to you know most of us and certainly not to people who are in uh, uh, who are um, uh, uh, very keen on understanding the legal principles behind it so um, so once again I think platformization is so powerful because it is sector agnostic because it is border agnostic because it doesn't speak a the legal language of one particular uh, individual country or legal system. And that is why uh, we have to look at EU regulation for one thing in order to change it, to define principles. As far as I know, there's now, right now no better way. Now, this of course was last, this was last week, uh, the congressional hearing, and like you, I was just stupefied by how ignorant most of the senators, the US senators, um, the questions they asked were just downright, you know, responding to, well, the most ignorant questions I could come up with, they actually asked. So it was very clear from the beginning, they had no technical clue about how this ecosystem works. Uh, they have no intention of, uh, you know, doing anything about regulation or even trying to understand what the underlying problem is. If, you know, they wanted to fix it, but of course there was nothing to fix in, you know, from their point of view. So. One thing that really struck me is that one thing that Mark Zuckerberg said, it was uh, he changed his mantra, his motto from move fast and break things into move fast with stable infrastructure. Now, why did that struck with me, that, uh, that mantra? Actually, because I thought, well, this is really the thing. Mark Zuckerberg wants to build infrastructure and he wants to do that by himself. He doesn't want any interference from governments or from you know, regulation because that is so important. Inf building infrastructure online is the heart of that ecosystem. So that is really what you know, he's really focusing on right now. Building that infrastructure is what he is uh, really trying to get at. So um, I think you know, that whole ecosystem, as I said, the entire borders between boundaries between infrastructures and sectors have become completely fluid and if there's anything that we need to focus on it's on defining the underlying principles of that system um, so the real question here is are societies european societies going to grant facebook rule setting power you know are we going to grant that to facebook or will tech companies collaborate with european governments and by the way, civil society, part, society partners, to define those principal rules. And that will bring me to my one but last point. I think one thing that Europe needs to do is not just crack down and sort of cause that you know, image of being uh, jealous of Silicon Valley, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that what one thing Europe needs to do is to stimulate nonprofit and public platforms and promote multi-stakeholder cooperation. And that is not, a trivial thing. I think this is something that Europe has been doing. By the way, the United States has also been doing in the previous century. And as a matter of fact, yesterday I've been reading a very wonderful book that I would like to recommend to you by Mariana Mazzucato. Uh, and the, um, she wrote a previous very successful book and the new book is called The Value of Everything. So remember that it's just come out and I think it's a wonderful book that talks about, you know, that public values first thing. And she says, there's this very incredible narrative of the market always taking care of innovation and the government, you know, costing money, basically, you know, not being um, uh, engaged in innovation. And that is totally untrue. It's a narrative that we've always, you know, been spread that people have been spreading it around, but that's simply untrue. And she has written this wonderful book uh, about four or five years ago, 2011, but I forgot the name, States. Entrepreneurial State. The entrepreneurial state is really about what uh, uh, public governance, governments can do in order to promote uh, innovation and you know, public governance. So that's really one of my, you know, my key uh, recommendations to governments is 
to really you know, engage with innovation. Here is that very simple layout of what are the actors involved in such sort of you know, multi-stakeholder cooperations, as I just pointed out. Of course, there's the American system. Let the, the markets you know, handle this ecosystem. They will do fine. Let them self-regulate. They will you know, make it a perfect world, if you believe that. We have, of course, the Chinese system who's doing, you know, doing that by way of pointing out the state as the most responsible actor. Of course, it's the most capitalistic market uh, system right now in the world. It's just that uh, state is dominating uh, the market. And in the United States, it's the other way around. And then, of course, I just talked about the European Rhineland model, which is basically focusing on a balance between the three and which focuses on multi-stakeholder organizations it's very Dutch to have multi-stakeholder organizations at Maatschappelijk Middenveld, as some of you may, uh, may sound the bell. That's what we always focus on. And if that is something that we can sort of reframe in a way in which we can reframe our approach to uh, being dominated by certain ecosystems, I think that uh, might do it. Now, I'll run through this because I have some examples of doing that, but Finally, I will come back to your last question. I think another thing that we need to do is to promote interdisciplinary research because I've been talking to uh, legal scholars, to economists, to you know, a number of other social scientists. And we as you know, media studies scholars, we have the pretty much now singled out all the, the invisible mechanisms by which these ecosystems are pushed. But we're now coming to our, the limits of our knowledge, which is how can we translate that into uh, legal scholarship? Because there's certainly, we are bouncing against more or less these different legal frameworks. So we need to deal with that. So I think we need more interdisciplinary frameworks to solve those really big questions. Now, this is the book that will com be coming out in the summer. We have published it in Dutch two years ago, but it's a very sort of um, very single uh, unrevised version two years ago. And the, the new book will focus on particularly what happened in 2017. So it's very recent. We could just plug in one sentence about the Cambridge Analytica story because it went to press uh, just two weeks ago. Uh, so it will be out in August. And uh, you know what I just presented today, it's like a tiny, tiny fraction of what's in the book. But um, I hope to, you know, to have this conversation with you. I think the ideal platform society does not exist, but you know, that doesn't uh, uh, keep me from believing in that as a European, sort of a European citizen, we can at least try to think through what it should look like if we had the power to change it. So that's what I've been, we've been trying to do. And I hope on that note that you will share my, not my optimism, but at least sort of ways of thinking progressively along the lines of, if we have a system, is there ways in this particularly European situation in which we can change that, in which we can rebalance the framework for organizing markets and states? So that I would like to bring into your discussion. Thank you. Thanks.